Alexander, Caesar, Napoleon. It is men like these which justify our species and embody the most redeeming qualities of mankind. But today, we see no such men. No giants walk among us. Man has become a herd animal. The mediocre, obedient, moral man has learned to see himself as the pinnacle of the human species. Its very aim, when he in fact represents its greatest danger. If you love mankind, then you should learn to love most of all the tyrant and the destroyer, for he is also a creator and a redeemer. In Genealogy of Morals, Nietzsche wrote, like a last signpost to the other path, Napoleon appeared, the most isolated and late-born man there has ever been, and in him the problem of the noble ideal as such made flesh. One might well ponder what kind of problem it is, Napoleon, this synthesis of inhuman and superhuman. Nietzsche believed that Napoleon was the last glimpse of the other path, the path towards the superhuman, the path to overcoming man, the path towards the classical ideal, a path which is diametrically opposed to the road which the West has taken since. In my last video, we discussed how, out of all of the animals, man is the most strayed from his instincts, from nature. But he also has the power of imagination and self-directed will. Man has the ability to overcome himself, to intentionally create something higher than himself. But how can man be overcome? In the jungle of modernity, how can we discover again that overgrown and forgotten other path? the path of Alexander, Caesar, and Napoleon, the path towards the noble ideal, the path towards Nietzsche's overman. In nature, evolution is driven in part through mutation, and it is no different in human civilization. It is the geniuses of our species which drive us forwards, the anomalies born to the right times, to the right fortunes. Alexander, Caesar, and Napoleon were these types of geniuses, Alexander the Great inherited the throne of his father, Philip of Macedon, in 336 BC. By 326 BC, just 10 years later, he was leading an invasion of India, having conquered Greece, Egypt, and the entire Persian Empire. Believing that he was the son of Zeus, he asked his men to refer to him as such and to bow down to him like a god. This was a man who was a synthesis of the inhuman and the superhuman. A man closer to the gods than to men, but also closer to the beast. Julius Caesar looked up to Alexander and wished to follow in his footsteps. But he was not like Alexander. He was a man of poor health and suffered from epilepsy. But he used his unrelenting ambition and will to climb the political hierarchy of Rome and became the catalyst which transformed Rome from a republic into an empire. After his assassination, it was said that a comet was seen in the sky which marked Caesar's ascent to godhood. Hundreds of years later, Napoleon said, Great men are meteors designed to burn so that the earth may be lighted. During the time of the French Revolution and the Enlightenment, he was a man pursuing the classical ideal in the tradition of Alexander and Caesar, a man who desired godhood. As Nietzsche wrote, he was the most isolated and late-born man there has ever been. Napoleon became the Emperor of France and even had himself crowned the Holy Roman Emperor, achieving what Caesar did not and leaving behind a stunning military career. When their civilizations were in decline or times of transition, these men appeared like demigods sent to earth and paved the way for new golden ages. Men who cling to traditional values and institutions have never saved a society from destruction. They are merely enacting a simulacrum of times gone by. Men like Alexander, Caesar, and Napoleon are true men of tradition, late-born men, Men whose spirit is born from an ancient time. Men who bring with them a virtue and power which has grown thin and petty in the traditionalists. These men, who are both beast and god, 
both inhuman and superhuman, are beyond the morality of traditionalists. They are the foundations upon which the traditionalist lays his morality, but they themselves are beyond good and evil. Nietzsche may have drawn inspiration for his idea of the Ubermensch as a political actor from Machiavelli's Prince. Writing during the Renaissance, Machiavelli hoped that a prince, a man favored by fortune and driven by ambition, would rise from the ranks of the people and restore Italy to its former glory. In chapter 18 of The Prince, Machiavelli describes the ideal prince as deploying the dual nature of man and beast, law and force. Machiavelli writes, Therefore, you must know that there are two modes of fighting, one in accordance with the laws, the other with force. The first is proper to man, the second to beasts, but because the first, in many cases, is not sufficient, it becomes necessary to recourse to the second. Therefore, a prince must know how to make good use of the natures of both the beast and the man. This rule was taught to princes symbolically by the writers of antiquity. They recounted how Achilles and many others of those ancient princes were given to Chiron, the centaur, to be raised and cared for. This can only mean that, having a half-beast, half-man as a teacher, a prince must know how to employ the nature of the one and the other, for the one without the other is not lasting. Machiavelli is arguing that a prince must employ law and force, and that these two methods of fighting correlate, respectively, with the natures of men and beasts. He cites the mythic figure of Chiron as evidence of ancient authors' understanding and symbolic representation of this knowledge. Machiavelli's beast man, which the prince must learn to emulate, seems to invert the idea of Christ as the God-man. When Machiavelli cites law and force as the key tools in a prince's rule, one cannot help but think of the biblical language of law and faith used by Paul. Machiavelli writes that when employing his animal nature, the prince should emulate the fox and the lion so as to recognize traps and frighten the wolves. The prince must employ both cunning and strength, just as he makes use of law and force. Christ is often figured as both a lamb and a lion, representing his mercy and his wrath. When taking all of this into account, it seems that Machiavelli is using Christian formulas and language to describe the prince, but replacing the god-man with the beast-man, faith with force, and the lamb with the fox. Machiavelli also seems to be employing an implicit, symbolic juxtaposition between Christian and classical notions of virtue. Machiavelli favors the virtues of being cunning, like Odysseus, and fierce, like Achilles, over the virtues of having integrity and being meek, like Christ. Machiavelli's prince is a synthesis of superhuman and inhuman, a beast man, a reanimalized man, who embraces his animal side and uses it to overcome his own humanity. Whereas Christ refused to lead a military revolt against Rome, and thereby refused to be a redeemer of this world, the prince, or Nietzsche's overman, is a redeemer and justifier of this world. This is why Nietzsche sometimes associated the Ubermensch with the Antichrist, and said that he would be akin to Caesar with the soul of Christ. Nietzsche believed that the geniuses of our species justify its existence. The highest reaching branches give meaning to the trunk. Without the grand pursuits of Caesar and Napoleon, without the poetry of Homer and Goethe, how could we justify the wretchedness of human life? How could we redeem man, the fallen animal, the animal who has strayed from the grace of nature, who has departed from his instincts? In Will to Power, Nietzsche wrote, the higher species is lacking, i.e. the species whose inexhaustible fruitfulness and power would uphold our belief in man. Think only of what is owed to Napoleon, almost all the higher hopes of this century. Similarly, in Genealogy of Morals, he wrote, But from time to time, grant me, assuming that, beyond good and evil, there are goddesses who can grant such wishes, one glimpse, Grant me but one glimpse only of something perfect, fully realized, happy, mighty, triumphant, of something that still gives cause for fear. 
A glimpse of a man that justifies the existence of man. A glimpse of an incarnate human happiness that realizes and redeems, for the sake of which one may hold fast to the belief in man. The destiny of Europe lies even in this, that in losing the fear of man, we have also lost the hope in man. Yes, even the will to man. The sight of man now fatigues. What is present day nihilism if it is not that? We are weary of man. For Nietzsche, nihilism is the loss of belief in our own species. In going down the path of the taming and domestication of man, we also destroy all which is great in man, everything which justifies man's existence. We lose faith in civilization when it only produces ugliness and pointless surplus. We lose faith in humanity when we no longer have any great endeavors, when we no longer produce any great individuals. Our departure from nature is justified by our visionary power, which makes us like the gods. Human agricultural and industrial civilization is justified because the comfort and excess which it provides allows for the poetry of Homer, the sculptures of Michelangelo, the conquests of Napoleon. But when civilization no longer produces these beautiful fruits, we start to ask ourselves, what is the point? Is it not better to go back to the jungle? And when mankind no longer produces great individuals, we begin to ask ourselves, is there any reason for us existing? Would not it be better to go back to the beast? Humanity is justified by our geniuses, by the great individuals who redeem civilization and transform it. Therefore, it is imperative that we organize civilization to allow for such individuals to flourish and to produce as many of them as possible. The aim of civilization should not be to make man more moral, to tame and denature the animal in man. The aim of civilization should be to allow for the superman to be born and to give him the conditions which he needs to flourish and to set his goals beyond man, to overcome man. Nietzsche wrote, The free man is a warrior. How is freedom measured in individuals and peoples according to the resistance which must be overcome, according to the exertion required to remain on top? The highest type of free men should be sought where the highest resistance is constantly overcome. Five steps from tyranny, close to the threshold of the danger of servitude. This is true psychologically if, by tyrants, are meant the inexorable and fearful instincts that provoke the maximum of authority and discipline against themselves, the most beautiful type, Julius Caesar. This is true politically, too. One need only go through history. The peoples who had some value, who attained some value, never attained it under liberal institutions. It was great danger that made something of them that merits respect. Those large hothouses for the strong, for the strongest kind of human being that has so far been known, the aristocratic commonwealths of the type of Rome or Venice, understood freedom exactly in the sense in which I understand it, as something one has and does not have, something one wants, something one conquers.